Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome here. And in welcoming you, I'd like to show my respects by acknowledging the Bejikul people, the traditional custodians of this land, and their elders past and present. You're all welcome to a fabulous occasion, um, particularly fabulous because this is the first occasion in our professorial lecture series that we've had a woman lecturing. And it's definitely the first occasion that we've had two women lecturing. So I hope there will be many, many more con um, inaugural lectures just like this. And, and they are all always fabulous occasions. On, on this occasion, we will hear first from Professor Susan Thompson, who will give her lecture on the topic, Making Place for People, Planning to Support Health and Wellbeing. And we will then hear from Professor Marie Sierra, who will talk to us on the topic, Making Nature, Social Constricted Nature, Constructed Nature, and a, and a Maker by Nature. Sorry, Marie, I made a mouthful of that, but I'm sure you'll do much better. Um, and they, they promise that they won't speak for more than two hours each. So you're... <laughs> Of course, I realise that the reason we have such a fantastically full hall is because there are refreshments and drinks afterwards. And, <laughs> and, and um, albeit that the lectures are the most important bit of this, um, these proceedings, there's still people coming in. That's great. There are a few seats at the front, so do come and have a seat. <clears throat> the, the, the drinks and networking afterwards are also really important, so I hope you'll stay for that. Immediately after the lectures, we'll have drinks and nibbles in the foyer of the chancellery. So um, my task tonight is to introduce our two lecturers and I will start with Susan. Um, Susan finally found her way to the University of New South Wales um, through a route which started in Sydney, took her to Tasmania at a certain point, and then brought her back to Sydney. She has degrees, um, she has a diploma in education from Macquarie, a Bachelor of Arts from Macquarie, a Master of Town and Country Planning from the University of Sydney, and a PhD from the University of Sydney. Eventually she found a truly great university to add to that list. <laughs> Susan is now Professor of Planning and Associate Director at the City Futures Research Centre at our university in the Faculty of Built Environment. As I said, she has qualifications in urban planning, geography and education. Her areas of expertise encompass cultural diversity in urban planning, meanings of home and the use of qualitative research methodologies in the built environment disciplines. And for the last 10 years, Susan's work has focused on the interdisciplinary area of healthy urban planning in research, teaching, and practice advocacy. In 2012, she was elected Fellow of the Planning Institute of Australia, and she is very widely published in Urban Planning and Health. Her research uses qualitative methods, and you'll hear, I'm sure, a lot about the methodologies, to understand the complex relationships between people and place. She's contributed to legitimizing the use of qualitative methods in built environment scholarship, initially as part of her doctorate and in subsequent research and publications. Since 2005, her central research focus has been on how places support people being healthy as part of their everyday, of everyday living, illuminating the critical role that urban planning plays in sustaining community well-being. She's won a $1.5 million competitive grant from the New South Wales Department of Health, she established the Healthy Built Environments Programme. She has a career total for research funding of $5 million from 27 research grants, over 135 published works, and that includes traditional scholarly outputs and um, outputs directed at policymakers and practitioners as well as the broader community. Her recent book, you can go out and buy this in 2015, is an international collection, the Routledge Handbook of Planning for Health and Wellbeing, Shaping a Sustainable and Healthy Future. Susan really has made an enormous contribution 
to teaching practice, curriculum development, scholarship, learning and teaching in urban planning as well as all of her research contributions and it's a, a great pleasure Susan to welcome you to uh, speak to us tonight and I'll repeat your topic, I'll try and get it right this time, making places for people planning to support health and well-being. Susan. Well, thank you very much to our President and Vice-Chancellor, Professor Ian Jacobs, for his warm and generous welcome. And I also pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land upon which we are meeting, particularly acknowledging the wisdom of the elders in placemaking and living in harmony with their environment. And it's it is a great honour to be presenting my professorial lecture tonight as someone who has been promoted through the ranks at the University of New South Wales from lecturer to professor. And speaking tonight gives me a chance to show my appreciation to the many people over many years who have influenced and supported me in different ways. And of course tonight is also a way of celebrating my career at UNSW. And it also gives me great pleasure to be presenting my professorial lecture with Professor Marie Sierra from the Faculty of Art and Design. And it's been delightful getting to know Marie around this event. So tonight I'm going to be talking about four things and I'm going to try and um, do it in under two hours. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about some of the major events, the people, the ideas that are the foundation of my work and who I am. Then I want to talk about some of the major themes of the work that I've done in around making places for people. And this goes across research, teaching and advocacy. And a final few reflections about where we're heading in terms of healthy placemaking and some thank yous. Well, learning starts early in life, informally with our families and favourite pets. And apparently this dog would take the most amazing uh, treatment from children, including me, and never barked or bit anyone. And then more formally, as we enter school. Here's my kindergarten class. Sadly, this image, without my wonderful teacher, Mrs Boofler, who I credit with starting me on my life, lifelong path of learning and the excitement around learning. But it wasn't all about slogging away at the books. Here is the cast of Hiawatha from Rose Bay High School in Hobart, Tasmania. Um, I wonder if you can spot me. I'm in the, uh, the last row, the Indian with the tallest feather. Um, and indeed, I have to say many of my teachers at school were influential in developing my love of learning and desire to find things out. And a particularly wise teacher suggested I try something new when I went to university. Well, this led me to taking geography as a double major at Macquarie University in the, dare I say it, 70s, the, the real halcyon days of no fees and being at Sydney's newest and youngest university. Studying geography with wonderfully inspired academics such as Professor Bob Fagan and he indeed was a lecturer when he first was lecturing me and then he was promoted through the ranks at Macquarie to full professor and Professor Rose and many, many others. It was there that I definitely fell in love with geography, something I hadn't studied before and with the ideas about linking diverse communities and places. And geography opened the door to my career in town planning. Here I am as a lowly planning officer in then South Sydney. Well, indeed, it wasn't in the South Sydney Council. It was, uh, that's where I started, South Sydney Council, and then not long thereafter went to Canterbury City Council in Sydney's middle southwestern suburbs. 
And this is where I started to learn about multiculturalism as well as the importance of social and cultural planning. And indeed, this was the place where I started to become aware of many of the inequities around planning for diverse communities and the problems of not hearing people at an in-depth level about some of their issues and their stories. But as well as working, um, I travelled. And yes, that is me with the perm in the, uh, in the 80s. That's what we did. And um, I, I went on, perhaps even to this day, I'd have to say, it was one of my most wonderful trips I've ever done. I cycled in the uh, southern province of uh, China. And uh, not, uh, I did it pretty luxuriously um, with, with a tour group. I didn't, um, I didn't know it at the time, but I would return to these rural lands where I learnt so much and met some amazing people who actually had never seen Caucasian people before um, on, on our tour. And in uh, th going there 30 years later to see that was the transformation of those lands that we cycled through. Absolutely incredible. And I returned to China well, several times, but just fairly recently, and showed some of the people that I was speaking to there these very images. And then to my PhD. And as Ian has already said, it took me a while to get to the greatest university. But I did take a while um, at Sydney University. And possibly you're not... Maybe some of you mightn't recognise this as an iconic building <laughs> of the uh, University of Sydney. Um, I confess I didn't take this picture and as I was trawling through images of, Sid of University of Sydney, most of them the sandstone buildings, um, but I did find this. This is a transient building, a key building in my life. I met my wonderful, uh, one of my wonderful PhD supervisors in this building and I also met my husband, but I'll tell you more about him later. Um, so we were studying uh, at the in the transit building and then later um, moved to the Wilkinson building where the Faculty of <laughs> Architecture and Design and I think a few other things is, is, um, is there currently. My doctoral research involved talking to women migrants about their meanings of home and I used qualitative research methods to understand their in-depth stories. And my struggles with legitimising the use of qualitative methods in the built environment was to, to become a defining force of my research career. And my doctoral research was also associated with my first formal links with UNSW. Here is my joint PhD supervisor, Professor Bob Zayner, who sadly is no longer with us, and he was a very influential person in my career and an amazing contributor to the life and the work of this university and many, no doubt, of you here today. And Professor um, Bob Zayner later became um, a, a boss to me when I started working here in 1991 in the old main building. And you can see there at the front of the building the falconer by the Australian sculptor Tom Bass adorning the entrance, entrance and the steps that I walked up many times to my office in the old School of Town Planning. And the beloved, our, I could say our beloved, uh, naked lady courtyard as we called it and all the students called it that, that was the tradition. Um, also the sculpture, sculpture by Tom Bass where we held many a student event. And while at UNSW, I finished my PhD and I couldn't um, but, uh, reflect looking back on a very happy moment in 1996 on graduation day with my parents and my wonderful University of Sydney supervisor, Dr James Connor, there um, celebrating, graduating with my PhD. So I was actually doing my PhD when I first came here in 1991. And then the School of Town Planning moved to the Red Centre and all sorts of things happened. That was around the early 2000s. 
when we were physically together as a faculty for the first time in our current home. And during that time, I held different positions within the faculty, um, things like presiding member of faculty, head of the planning program for some years, the director of the Healthy Built Environments program, and now, as Ian has mentioned, associate director, city wellbeing in the City Futures Research Centre. So now I'd like to turn to talk briefly about some of the major themes in my work. And first, I'd just like to share with you some of the seminal urban thinkers, researchers and practitioners, people such as William White, although I suppose he's perhaps more a sociologist, Jane Jacobs, who many of you will know, and more recently the work of Jan Gell, have shaped the ways in which I see placemaking, certainly with people at the centre. And I've met Jan Gell on several occasions, heard many of his lectures, but did not meet um, of either of the, the others who have been very, very influential thinkers in my work. And I think the other thing that's very important to say is that my professional origins in urban planning practice have also been highly significant in my academic career and my determination to contribute to the community of practitioners. So building on my work in cultural diversity in the late 1990s, I could see that healthy planning was an emerging field of importance, both in Australia and internationally. Concern was starting to grow about the cost of chronic disease, largely associated with our sedentary way of life. And I think increasingly there was this realisation about the important role that the built environment could play in supporting people's health as part of everyday living. And this eventually led to me being focused fully on, I suppose, the, the intersection of public health and urban planning and being successful um, with different grants, different work, but particularly uh, getting that amazing um, vote of um, faith, I guess, um, from New South Wales Health, who funded, initially funded the Healthy Built Environments Program. And part of the uh, work that we did in the Healthy Built Environments Program, and I had an amazing team of people, a small team, but real dynamos, but we came up, this is one of our major pieces of work, was our literature review where we, um, we came up with two or three, what we call three domains, um, where a lot of um, the work that we've done since sort of s hangs on that scaffold. And these domains are around how the built environment can support physical activity, how it can support access to healthy food, and how it can support social interaction. <coughs> and those three things are three of the best ways that we can protect from uh, chronic disease. And here I particularly want to acknowledge the wonderful work of my then PhD student, Jennifer Kent, now postdoctoral fellow at the University of Sydney. Ian, we've got to get her back. So let me tell you a little bit about health, how healthy placemaking can come about. Well, healthy places support be people being physically active. And walking is arguably the most important. And Jan Gell talks a lot about this, and he has some wonderful quotes, which I really wanted to read to you, but I thought, no, um, I just won't get them in in the two hours, so I haven't got them here. Um, walking for pleasure could be on a cold day, and here I found these walkers in the north of England uh, alongside uh, a beautiful beach even though it was very chilly. Walking could be up a magnificent staircase like this in Geelong that absolutely invites you to explore and enjoy such a space. Walking's particularly important when it's done in conjunction with catching all forms of public transport here in Berlin. And we're talking about walking for all ages and all communities. Cycling is also a very important aspect of physical activity, whether it's for recreation, and here it does look rather serious, uh, this cyclist I found on Sydney's Inner West Greenway some years ago, 
But cycling's also not just for recreation, it's very much for transport. Here's some cyclists in Melbourne. And tourists, these tourists seeing the sights around the Sydney's uh, Opera House forecourt. But unlike Australia, cycling in Europe is commonplace. It's encouraged in policy and supported with excellent physical infrastructure. And this has been the situation for some time. It's also culturally accepted. This is a scene from Copenhagen where cycle-friendly policies have been in place since the 1970s and where Jan Gell has his uh, central practice. Cycling is everywhere in Freiburg in Germany, where I recently uh, visited. And all ages cycle. And where this sort of freeway construction has long been a dinosaur. Freiburg has its cycling freeway, where it's pretty busy. And you, have, you do have to be careful as a pedestrian, but there's enormous understanding of sharing the path in, in that city, certainly what I found. Also in Freiburg, there is the Rad station where you can securely park your bike close to other forms of public transport. You securely, the, you can see this young woman leaving the secure area with her bike. There are all the bikes ready um, for people to collect them when they come back. And then you can get easily from the bike parking to the trams or the central railway next door. So healthy places like this are very much about privileging and supporting both walking and cycling. They're much less about car ownership and car use with the growth of car share schemes. And this one, I'm proud to say, is in Sydney and you'll see a lot more and I'm so sure you will have seen many of the, the go-get cars and there are other schemes in Sydney. And I think also what we're going to see more of, this is from Berlin, but the installation of electricity charging stations across cities. So making a healthy place is very much about making an environmentally sustainable place as well. Healthy place making also embraces giving communities access to healthy foods. And planners need to ensure that there are places where markets can be set up be they permanent markets or just those on a Saturday or a Sunday morning. This one's in Darwin. This very historical market in Freiburg centre, the Munsterplatz. Amazing array of all sorts of uh, fruits and vegetables, produce, incredible berries, uh, absolutely wonderful. And this market in Portland, Oregon, which is close to many rich farming communities who bring their produce to the city every weekend. And on a broader scale, ensuring access to healthy food is associated with planning policy that protects viable agricultural land from inappropriate development is, is absolutely critical. It's also about allowing urban agriculture in the form of community gardens. Here is one of the famous allotments in the UK, this one in Newcastle in the north of England. And in Portland, this community garden is one that's gardened by students in association with the Portland State University. And this community garden in Valban, a very famous suburb of Freiburg in Germany. And here is a school kitchen garden, this one in northwestern Sydney, and there are many across Australia. Many of you may have children at schools with kitchen gardens or have that experience yourself, where you learn to grow healthy food and how to cook it as well in an enjoyable and fun way. Community gardens are prevalent in public housing estates particularly important in bringing diverse cultural groups together. As we found out in research we conducted at UNSW some years ago, and that was with colleagues Linda Bartolome, Linda Corkery and Bruce Judd, long-term colleagues of mine at the University <coughs> of New South Wales. And community gardens can be part of large open space green areas in cities. This one is in Boston. 
and it's part of the Rose Kennedy Memorial Greenway in the downtown area of Boston, which creates a wonderful community green space for all in that city. And this brings me to the last domain in my schema of healthy placemaking, connecting communities. And what better way to do that than in green open spaces, which are critical to our mental and physical health. And there's much evidence and has been around for a long time confirming that. And green space is also essential for sustaining our environment and for cooling our cities. Green spaces can incorporate all sorts of wonderful elements, wonderful um, aspects of design. Again, this is from the Rose Kennedy Greenway with a father and his child cooling off on a hot summer's day in Boston. Or, again, the Greenway in Boston just to be able to walk in a cool green space in the centre of a large city. We've done some wonderful green spaces in Sydney and you would know and I hope use many of them on a daily basis. Many of these are associated with our world famous waterways and planning policies have ensured public access to the harbour foreshore tributaries which I think is a really important legacy of planning in, in our city. Green open spaces in cities are important the world over. This is just a small, tiny part of the huge Tiergarten in central Berlin, which is an absolute delight, as is the Phoenix Park in Dublin. This is a very informal part, and I just loved all that grass and that greenness. And this one in the centre of Shanghai, the People's Park, where many communities connect with each other in different activities on any day. And it's important to ensure that all members of the community can easily access green space, whether they can walk within it, but just to look at it is really, really beneficial to our health. And to have fun. And we found these people cooling off in Freiburg, which has just gone through a heat wave. Um, and I just love this, uh, this guy in, in the middle of, uh, of, the, of the glorious river. Um, on a hot evening, I think this is about seven or eight o'clock in the evening. And not forgetting our animals when we, we know increasingly they have to be specifically exercised, we, we live more and more in apartments, they depend on us for good health. And the dog park is an increasingly important component of green space provision. <laughs> It's prevalent across the world. This is quite a famous and one that I really love in Leichhardt. And this is the famous Cafe Bones where you can enjoy a puppuccino with your dog as you, um, as you take a rest from your walk around the park. And it's also about enjoyment and fun. So a healthy place is where all members of the community feel they belong. It's where there is a sense of belonging for diverse communities, where people can sit, relax and watch the passing parade. And healthy places give us a reason to smile, to have some fun and to enjoy. An example is this huge open lounge room in Sydenham under the flight path. Another, some kangaroos hopping down the main street in Perth. This might well make you smile as you walk along to, to or from the office, particularly if you've had a tough meeting or something like that. Or an intriguing life-size group of interesting people, this one in Hong Kong. Or as we found in Boston, coming across a concert called Too Many Trombones. And I think there were about 22 trombones, all professional trombone players, on the Rose Kennedy Memorial Greenway in Boston. It was a delight and everyone was smiling and everyone was talking to each other in between the wonderful, gorgeous music. Or a Berlin bear on its head with an Indigenous Australian theme. That certainly made us smile. Or just a balcony, this one also in Berlin, with some interesting characters looking down on the street below. 
And we did smile so much in Bristol when we found Sean in the city. Now, some of you might not be um, great fa fans of Sean the Sheep, um, a, fa a favourite cartoon character of mine. This was a particular uh, event um, for a, a major charity event in Bristol where Sean the Sheep um, is... Well, it's, he, he's, it is his home, the home of Ardman Productions, where Sean comes from. And these sorts of things definitely connect us with each other, give us a reason to smile, to have fun, to laugh and be happy, all central to good health. And so now to my final theme in my work, its impact. My work in healthy placemaking has opened up important new opportunities in teaching, which has been a central part of my work here at the University of New South Wales. And I'm thrilled that we've been able to establish new undergraduate and postgraduate classes in healthy planning, as well as doing a lot of professional development seminars, programs, education in this area. Our research has had an impact on policy at the federal level with some uh, government <coughs> policy and also working, um, we've done a lot of work alongside the likes of the National Heart Foundation. I have some amazing colleagues in the National Heart Foundation and I have to say they just, well not have to, I'm delighted to say they are doing amazing things supporting health place making across Australia and internationally. Our work has influenced key policies and strategies coming out of New South Wales Health and the Department of Planning. And anyone, if you're interested, I know I'm going through this rather quickly, but I'm happy to point you in the direction of these policies afterwards if you, if you, want, to, um, if you want the details. And here I am with some very dear colleagues across health and built environment, working in private, public sector, as well as the NGO sector. We together worked to be um, able to get an objective to pr pr protect human health in the New South Wales Planning Bill 2013. And this was the first time in Australia that such an objective had been put in a piece of, um, well, in a planning bill. There's a big story about why it hasn't become legislation, but that's for another day. Um, but and also two, uh, one of two international examples. So here we are celebrating this very important moment after a lot of st strategizing and incredible hard work, bringing the evidence to, to the policies. We decimate, oh, we decimate, we disseminate our work <laughs> in different ways to make sure the message goes well be beyond the academic community. We um, have been, or I have been involved with different colleagues from health, writing a column since 2010 for a magazine called New Planner. It's a quarterly magazine which goes out to planning professionals in New South Wales. So that's a lot of columns now that are just talking about some of the issues to do with healthy placemaking. Healthy planning now features in some key planning texts here in Australia and internationally. And I confess I had a hand in these particular volumes. And the impact of the message is spreading. I was recently invited to be part of a think tank on healthy cities at Harvard University involving the Graduate School of Design and the School of Public Health. And it was uh, really exciting and just delightful to be there to, to share our, our mutual understandings of healthy placemaking. I was also in China last year uh, leading a seminar on healthy planning in Suzhou City, which is not far from Shanghai, for planning professionals. So what might be the future for healthy placemaking? I'd just like to offer a few thoughts before I wrap up with some thank yous. We have to ensure that we provide a healthy city for everyone, especially for children and for the elderly. Denser cities will offer more opportunities for walking, cycling, and less need for cars. 
that's for sure. But have we got the mix right? Are we densifying some of our cities too quickly and with little thought for the communities who are already there? Are we respecting those communities' wishes? This is um, a cross put up after an iconic tree was removed so that an additional apartment in a development of, I think, well over 350 apartments could go ahead. That did a lot to, dis to really dampen the enthusiasm of the existing community for this development and also it left a bad taste in the mouth, in the, mouth of, of, um, the support that we need to have from our communities for the planning process. But clearly we are doing some things really well. And you may have seen this amazing building in central Sydney. If you haven't, you should go down and have a look. It really is incredible. And there are other examples across the world. This is in Portland, Oregon, back to Sydney, just down the road from the University of Victoria Park and very famous district, Valban in Freiburg. So lastly, to my thank yous. And there are many thank yous. And David, my husband, said, well, if you do all the thank yous, that will probably take up the whole of the lecture. So I apologise that I won't be thanking everyone in person. But I really do want to say thank you to the many stakeholders that I've worked with in healthy built environments for quite some years now. For people like Peter Sainsbury, from New South Wales Health, another Peter, Peter McHugh from the Premier's Council for Active Living, my colleagues at the Heart Foundation, Julianne Mitchell in particular, the local health districts across New South Wales, my friends, the Department of Planning, especially Norma Shanky Williams, Planning Institute of Australia and many, many more. My colleagues in the Faculty of the Built Environment particularly Emily and Greg, who've put up with me for quite a while now, working, working away in the Healthy Built Environments program. To Joanna, who worked with me initially and we got the whole thing happening. To Jen and to Jodie, who has been an inspiration through her wonderful design work. My colleagues in the planning program and the City Futures Research Centre. Colleagues past and present. And I want to say thank you to my students, those who've been in my classes and those who I've supervised doing postgraduate research. And I want to say a special thank you to my dean, Professor Alex Zahns, for getting the first woman in the faculty to full professor through the UNSW Promotions Committee. I really felt sorry for you, Alec, having to front that committee. <laughs> but thank you so much for doing that. And to my family, this is my brother Steve, my baby brother who's about up here, and uh, my sister-in-law Prema and my nephew Lakshman and niece Gatanjali, who fe feature in quite a lot of my healthy planning talks on why it's so important to make places healthy for our children. Perhaps the most important legacy of my work. And to my dearest mum, some of you might have seen this photo before. This is a gala opening concert of the Sydney Opera House in 1973. And there she is. <laughs> Violinist Ruth McKayley, who proudly performed on that occasion. And I hope she'll be able to watch the video of this talk. Hi, mum. <laughs> and to my husband, David. Now, I want you to note he's seen here wearing his UNSW cap and I refuse to show him any of these pictures or tell him what I was going to say about him in my lecture. He's sitting here in Boston, once again, waiting patiently while I take yet another photo. I took 2,500 photos on our recent trip, which was over five weeks. He's been very patient, incredibly supportive, of me, my soulmate, from the south of Germany to central Australia. None of this would mean anything without you, David. Thank you very much.
well, I'm the dean that you thanked, but it really isn't for you to thank me, it's for me to thank you for the privilege of working with you. And let me say that um, 45 minutes of cross-examination, what I call the Spanish Inquisition, is not much fun. Picture of a V formation of about 12 people with the then VC in the middle, all examining Susan's work and me being cross-examined, <laughs> defending her, but it was an easy defense. And she is our first uh, female professor, and for that we are ashamed, but we're trying to do more for that. But th that's not really the only contribution you make. Um, in our faculty, we believe that sustainable, livable and equ equitable cities are very important for the future of the world and also the generations that follow. And what Susan has done is connect us very strongly to that fundamental relationship between thinking, planning, designing, building, living, rethinking, and doing it again. And really, if you go back 100 years, people evacuated cities because they were unhealthy, inequitable, uh, abusive, really, in many ways, environmentally catastrophic, and of course, we invented the motor car, which produced a new utopia, and what soon became a dystopia. And in, in, a, in, a, in a way, Susan's way of thinking is fundamental to us re reconnecting what we need to do to make a better world, because density is here to stay, and it's increasing, and as you've pointed out, Land is precious and so is the environment for not just humans but for, as you pointed out, other sentient beings. I recommend you to, I think it's called Catmosphere in Surrey Hills, which is a new cafe for cats. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it's a very serious topic and we take it very seriously. And Susan leads in this area, connecting us not only to what we see as our core discipline, but recognising that to achieve what we need to achieve, we link with other disciplines. And of course, medicine comes to the fore, but so do the social sciences, and so do the art and design areas. So many ways of working out, not only how to move policy, as you have done, so that we can lay better foundations for a better future, but also be able to change behaviour for a better world. So in all these ways, you've led our faculty and you've made our faculty, I think, world class because I was talking to a Harvard professor the other day and he said they've got a new way of thinking about their faculty. And they said their faculty is really now going to be about livable and sustainable cities. And indeed, their architecture discipline is going to be about humanitarian architecture. And I thought, hold on, this is 2015, I thought, we were doing this in 2009. But maybe you helped us. <laughs> maybe that you helped them, actually. So I don't know. But Susan is really a great person for us in this university, doing great things for Australia, around the world. And through her work, we are going to have a better future. So thank you very much for all that good work. Thank you, Susan. A wonderful lecture, really, really beautifully presented, and um, some wise words from, from Alec as well that followed. I should emphasize that Alex didn't mean that we're ashamed that Susan is our first female <laughs> professor. He meant that uh, we're ashamed that Susan is our first female professor in built environment, and we, um, as some of you will have read in the papers, we have plans to appoint well over 100 female professors at the highest level over the next decade so that we can make sure we end up 50-50 at all grades in this university. Um, my my um, next privilege is to introduce Professor Marie Sierra from our Faculty of Art and Design. And Maria, I'll, I'll uh, try and do it again. You're going to speak on making nature, socially constructed nature and a maker by nature, and um, you also have a fantastic career. 
Marie, Marie's route to Sydney is rather more tortuous than Susan's. Um, I think, I, let's see if I can get this right. Chicago, Philadelphia, Tulsa, Tasmania, and that's where you both connected, although you didn't meet until now, and then Melbourne, and then Sydney. That's a pretty uh, wonderful combination of places, and it's, it's great that you have also um, ended up at this university. Marie joined UNSW Art and Design in July last year as Deputy Dean and Head of School. She's, as many of you will know, held numerous solo and group exhibitions within Australia and overseas. She's published many articles on contemporary art. She's won grants and awards, including five Australia Council grants. She lived in Melbourne for 24 years, where she built an art practice which was fo focused on nature as a social construct. And while there, she worked in se senior roles at the Victorian College of Arts, the University of Melbourne, at RMIT. And prior to joining UNSW, she was professor and head of the Tasmanian College of the Arts at the University of Tasmania. And she's currently the chair of the Australian Council of University Art and Design Schools. I've had a look at um, the list of amazing productivity that um, Marie has accomplished. She, uh, I read some of her pub published work, um, Transformative Aspects of Education, Water on Self, a conference, Rising Stars Artist Initiative, National Teaching Research Nexus, Thinking the Future, Art, Design and Creativity, Image, Text and Sound Conference. And I, I could actually have gone on for a very long time. There are about 100 different things, all equally fascinating. She's examined PhDs, masters, um, postgraduate research. As I said, she's chair of the Australian Council, University Council for Art and Design Schools, um, Tasmanian Cultural um, <coughs> Advisor, Advisory Policy Committee. She has done an enormous amount of public speaking, consultancies, 13 solo exhibitions. Um, these are on all sorts of fascinating things, planning, justice, stomata, I think fluid dynamics as well, and, and many other things. She has ARC grants. She's done an enormous amount in learning and teaching. It's, it's a wonderful career, and it's fantastic that she is now professor in our university. Marie, I'm going to try and say it one more time without error. You are very welcome. We're looking forward to hearing your lecture, Making Nature, Socially Constructed Nature, and a maker by nature. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to speak, Vice Chancellor, Professor Ian Jacobs. And also, Susan, it's been absolutely wonderful to meet you, um, and it's been a, a privilege to get to know somebody else in the university. That's one of the tricks when you're new. And as you'll find out, I'm very used to being new. That is the um, mouthful of my talk, Making Nature, Socially Constructed Nature, and a Maker by Nature. And before I begin, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, past and present. And also, I just want to acknowledge Susan's wonderful introduction in relation to indigenous placemaking, which I thought was particularly beautiful. Now, I'm going to um, not quite make this a where do you come from? But when you've been as peripatetic as I have, and I'm not particularly peripatetic compared to some people, I thought I'd start at the beginning. I'm only a second generation American, I think. I'm never really clear how you count generations. Um, but my grandparents were on the left-hand side, my paternal side, uh, Slavic, Yugoslavic. On the right-hand side, Spanish. and. On the left-hand side, that grandfather who came to the States by a very <coughs> long and tortuous route overland and then on a ship from Amsterdam, had his name changed as he went through Ellis Island. I don't think he particularly chose the name that he ended up with, but the spelling of his name got changed. And became a citizen only after many years of many applications and having to prove um, that he was worthy of American citizenship and also having to swear that he had no allegiance to any king anywhere else and so on. So that's one of about 13 pieces of paper it took for him to be a citizen. So he did it right. By contrast, 
my Spanish grandfather on the right, was an opera singer. And he turned up in New York to sing in an opera for three months. He stayed in New York for 65 years on a three-month visa. <laughs> <laughs> and that combination of serious paperwork and devil may care, I think, says who I am. <laughs> And this is the family I grew up in. Uh, my wonderful parents, my two brothers, and my sister. I'm the youngest of four. The first strategic thing I ever did was to be born on my father's birthday. I'm the youngest by a little ways, and I wasn't planned. So being born on his birthday turned out to be a very good idea. So I'm the lucky last. And you can kind of see the difference between my parents and the echo of that, that grandparenthood, my mother in print. Any photo you see of her today will be in print. She's wearing Paisley, a groovy dress, incredibly groovy woman. My dad always in a white business shirt, in complete denial of the, the blue class, blue collar roots he was from. And that ended up being very important. Because I was the youngest, my mother took me to the Philadelphia Museum. She decided I was going to come with her because she was overweighting. She'd already waited to, to bring up the three my three siblings, and she just took me everywhere that she, she went. So I had a fantastic education as a young child inside museums. And I think we're still learning about how to use museums correctly. Um, my mother was from Manhattan, so we used to go to New York quite a bit too. But I had an education of Rodin, of Duchamp, of Jean Arp, and of Alexander Calder, amongst many others. Uh, Indeed, actually, the Philadelphia Museum has a number of Calders because Alexander Calder, all the Calders are from Philadelphia. And when I was sourcing this image, I remember when this work was, uh, well, at least when I first saw it, I think it hadn't been very long installed. And the Philadelphia Museum now has, uh, thanks to Drexel University's initiative, an iPad application where kids learn physics at the art museum. And one of the things that they do with this mobile, which is called Ghost, is that they learn about torque and rotational equilibrium through studying the sculpture on an iPad app. So there's a STEAM initiative for you with science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. Um, so art can teach scientists too. So that was my, my formative time. And I think also the other thing I learned was about the importance of patronage, because a lot of these works, in particular, for example, um, the Duchamps, are part of the Arnsberg collection, for example. Uh, that is, people who are able to buy art and invest in art giving it back to the public. And my mother used to say, you know, when I would ask what that pluck was for, the nice rich people give us their works to look at, Marie. That's what's it about. <laughs> So if you ever get to be rich, darling, <laughs> give it to me, then give what's left over to them. Now, my next art family, this, uh, somewhere along the line, I grew legs. I grew incredibly long legs, made it lo look longer. This is when I first joined university. And this was my next art family. Uh, my father wanted us all to go to university. Only two of us did, my oldest brother and I, at least to begin with. And to his chagrin, I studied art and my brother studied philosophy. <laughs> he, was very, he was very disappointed in us. Um, but uh, he still was willing to back my going nonetheless. As you know, university in the US is very expensive. Uh, at least being the youngest, there was an opportunity to save up a bit of money for me to go. And these people on the bottom were Bill and Harriet Derivere, who were really my extended art family. This is a recent picture of them. They, they, were, much, they were in their 40s when, when I knew them. And I worked in Bill's basement for four years as a jeweler, my first degrees in gold and silversmithing. And I also had another job in a commercial gold and silversmithing outfit, um, setting solitaires. You'll never see me in a solitaire, I can tell you. Uh, setting solitaires and sizing rings. But Bill paid me $4 an hour to work in his basement for four years. And in the summer, we would paint his house, which is what I'm doing there. And that's a, one piece of uh, a large body of work that I made during that period. And actually, it was interesting digging up my old slides and old images, because I realized that I work in series. That is, I'll make a series of work, a number of works, about a particular idea. And I really learned that in my time with Bill. The other thing that Bill taught me was that I was a maker. Now, this is a recent image uh, about making and making culture. 
which is about a shift in technology and innovation in relation to learning. And we do this at UNSW Art and Design. Now it's particularly about building things that are technological, using old bits of computers, wiring them together and making things. So I find it very interesting now that making's okay, because for a long time making wasn't okay. You had to be conceptual. It wasn't good to be a maker. So I've been very happy to recognize in putting this talk together that I'm, I'm actually a, very much a maker. In fact, Bill used to say that you know, when he was teaching me to be a jeweler, and of course being a jeweler is a very haptic and a very fine art, that the intelligence needs to come from your brain down your arm and into your hand. And that's put me on a lifelong journey to thinking about different kinds of literacy other than the literacy that we know so well in universities. So visual literacy, haptic literacy, spatial literacy, physical literacy, which means the literacy of physical forms, which you'll see more of in my work and in my teaching later, and also things that musicians know very well, like kinesthetic memory. And I'm a real advocate for these things in the art world and them being recognized, and that's been an important part of my work. So I did my undergraduate degree in the US, and then the, the bug bit me, the peripatetic keep moving west bug that seems to be in my family. And I ended up in Tasmania. <laughs> doing my master's degree. Now, in 1984, only 25, just imagine this, those of you from the university and understand the system, only 25 private students, full fee paying students per year were allowed into Australia from the US in 1984. 25, <laughs> that was the upper limit. And I went to two different universities, so I was a semester out of sync. And so I was somewhat in sync with the Australian year, but it still meant that I was number 27 in the queue. And I had to wait for two people to change their minds in order to get a student visa. So I had a bag packed. Uh, my passport was off in Chicago, which was the nearest consulate, to be sorted. And I finally got a phone call to say, one person has dropped out your number 26, and my mother's going, oh my God, she's leaving home, I'm, because I'm the last one to leave, <laughs> the empty nest syndrome. And why are you going so far? And I went, well, you know, look at the grandparents. What do you expect? Um, and then I got a phone call to say you're number 25. I was on the flight within 24 hours and in Tasmania. Now, ironically, I nearly came here to what was then City Art Institute. There were only two master's degrees in Australia at the time, the one at City Art Institute and the one at the University of Tasmania. And thinking, as it turned out, quite wrongly, that I would eventually end up in the States again, I thought, I better do a degree in a university or it might not have any currency when I go back. And actually, I had a really wonderful two years it, doing my master's degree in Tasmania because everyone else in the degree, there was eight of us, so that was a big program, uh, we were all from somewhere else. In fact, there was a Canadian who asked me what I was running away from. I thought that was very insightful. And, um, and everyone else was an Australian. There was only one Tasmania in the, in the program, Tasmania in the program. And those eight people, have, I've kept, we've all kept in touch and we're all good friends. And I, I don't know if one of them may even be in the audience tonight. Um, and one of them has just become a, a dean in a university in the UAE, who's also one of my PhD students now. So it was a, an incredibly formative time. After that, I moved to Melbourne, and I was in Melbourne for 24, nearly 25 years. So if I'm from anywhere, despite my accent, I normally say I'm from Melbourne, because it's the only place I've spent any more than seven years. And I'm going to move quickly through some of the work that I've made in, in my life. Like all artists I've made, when you get to my age at least, I've made a lot of work. And, and I've moved from being a gold and silversmith into ceramics, into sculpture. And my move along those lines, and you might have even been able to see it in the piece of jewelry, which was a badge, you know, looking at systems for self-reward and how people are rewarded for things, was always very conceptually driven. But it took me a while to connect that to the maker because the, the art world at the time said you know, those, two, those two things are different. So this, for example, is a work I did at the State Library of Victoria as a part of a commissioned exhibition called Knowledge is Power. And it has a maker element. It's cut by hand, cut with a jigsaw. I did try to take it to a laser place to cut it, but they got to the third letter and the book blew up because it got too hot. And so it didn't work. Laser cutting was new then. And um, at this time, I was working at RMIT. I'll just show you a close-up of that. 
At this time, I was working at RMIT. So I landed in Melbourne, took me about a year to get a job. I applied for everything that was advertised. That annoying thing that happens in Australia of all university jobs having to be advertised, even if somebody's queued up for it. And this was the very middle 1980s. So all the jobs were being advertised and turned into permanent jobs as colleges of advanced education, where a lot of the art schools were placed, were becoming part of universities. That wasn't the case with RMIT, but it was with a lot of them. So I applied for a job in jewelry knowing I wouldn't get it because the person who was earmarked for it who'd been casual there for a while was a much better jeweler than I was and I had moved on into other disciplines. But about a week later I was watering my garden and the head of the jewelry department from RMIT turned up and said, are you still looking for work? And I thought, well yeah, it was only a week ago, so yes, I'm, still <laughs> I'm here watering the roses. And he said, Inga King, who's a well-known Australian sculptor, of German heritage, Inga King has just retired and we need a woman in sculpture. And I thought, that's not how I wanted to be invited, <laughs> but I'll take it. <laughs> and I ended up at RMIT for 15 years and I was there at a really, really interesting and very formative time as uh, Leon Van Schaik, who I consider one of my de facto mentors, arrived on the scene. I did my PhD in, our, in the Faculty of Architecture and Design, as it was called then. I worked in the Faculty of Art, Design, and Communication in the Sculpture Department, but simultaneously in senior positions. So one of my joys was getting called to a meeting with, that I had to go to in the Chancellery when I had my steel cap boots on, covered in plaster. I did always learn to wear a boiler suit, so at least I could peel off a layer like a banana and, and go straight, straight into the meetings. So I... I have kind of two streams in my work, a gallery-based stream and also an outdoor stream. I prefer the outdoor stream, but it's a much more challenging stream to work in. Um, I always have been very interested in space and space and spatial analysis. For example, this exhibition, which was called Planning, uh, which was made up only of T-squares, was in the basement of an uh, artist-run initiative called The Basement, run by Patricia Piccinini, who the artists in the room will recognize her name. And it was about the history of this building been a number, being a number of different things in its time. It was a building that was built in the 1880s. Um, I also had big ex other exhibitions around Australia and overseas. I decided to put this one is in. Some people may recognize this venue. This is First Draft when it used to be in Parramatta Road, so First Draft West. I started working in large scale outdoor formats as part of an invitation to be involved in large-scale projection. Now, large-scale projection is quite easy now because it's digitized, but in this time, and this was in the, the 90s, middle 90s, at this time it was still analog, and you would have to print on orthographic film uh, about uh, an image about six inches by six inches, put it between two pieces of glass, tape it up around the edge, not all the way though, <laughs> only around some of the edge, and stick it in a projector that they use it in theater. And the kind of th projector is called a penny, and it looks like a cannon. It's about the size of a coffee table. If you taped the glass all the way around, your slide would crack because of the heat. So these projectors weighed um, about 100 kilograms, and we had to get them up the stairs onto the roofs of buildings to project onto other buildings, as we did here. And actually, this work has an interesting story behind it. This was when Optus, the, the um, telecommunications company, was cutting into the market, uh, and you were supposed to choose of whether you wanted to go with Optus or go with Telstra. We ran this image and this idea as a mock-up past the, the CEO, and he said, that looks fine. Yes, we're happy to be part of this project. The day, this was weeks in advance of this festival, this night festival, and we got the projector up the stairs in the afternoon, came back at nightfall to switch it on, and we were told to go away because the CEO twigged to what the milling tool kind of meant about Optus cutting into the market. <laughs> and, and it was a near miss thing about this, this work going ahead or not. Um, so I, I had a very quick lesson in the politics of the image. And I did a number of large scale projections in a number of different places. This is uh, another one. This is one of my favorites, which I like to think of as sort of measuring to the moon, that bright spot in the, in the corner is measuring to the moon. But um, other than image based work and text based work, a lot of my work is still has an element of the, the made about it. This again is another work from the 90s. This is one of my favorites, but one of the hardest ones to show slides of. It's in an exhibition space called Linden. 
and there's a hoop pine planted outside Linden, and that had just been planted about a year before this exhibition, and it was planted as a reconstruction of the original garden. So the idea of reconstruction is, is very interesting in and of itself, this idea of reclaiming history as it once was, particularly with the living thing like a tree. So I did a trace diagram of the tree, and then I made it in steel. Um, so it's, it's just welded in heat form steel. I used my gold and silver smithing skills on a non-ferrous metal, completely different discipline, but same principle, except much bigger. So instead of bending things with a pair of pliers, I was bending them with a vise in my entire body, and I'm not that big, but I know a lot about leverage. <laughs> and uh, um, it was a frame, it's amazing what you could do when you understand a lot about leverage. It was a, a, a frame that framed the tree. I actually, to photograph this, I had to take one step to the left, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see it at all. In fact, the tree grew another little, whoop, on the top uh, in, while I was, the month or so it took me to make it. And when you turned around 180 degrees, you faced the, the rest of the space, which is a, a grand old Victorian building with the reconstructed garden. Um, and I used the frame of the, the archway as a kind of lens in a camera and, and the fireplace. So the show only had three elements. So I'm well known for doing extremely sparse shows. Doesn't mean they don't take a lot of work to do, but very, very sparse. And inside that frame is an identical replica of that tree, but in nichrome wire. And when you walked in, the nichrome wire would heat up. Nichrome wire is what you have on a stovetop, except it's the native wire on the inside. The thing with nichrome wire is not only is it very hot and it burn you, but it also electrocute you if you, <laughs> if you touched it. The person in me who now looks after work health and safety would never allow this now. <laughs> But at the time, it was OK, because it was the 90s. Um, and this whole idea was kind of making the, the space like the inside of a camera lens or also the inside of the eye. So an image, as you probably know, hits the back of your eye. It's, it's upside down. And your brain turns it the other way around. And that's in part what I was working with, with the, the upside down image. And also, I was reading Judith Williamson's Decoding Advertising at the time, which had a lot about nature and culture and, and um, Na and of course, from Levi Strauss, the idea of nature being brought into culture through a transformative process, and that one of those classic transformative processes is heat, like eating food. So you eat, take something from the garden, you heat it, you transform it into a cultural product. And that became a kind of pivot point for what my PhD ended up being about. So by now I had a master's degree, I'd had it for a few years, and PhDs when art were new, and by this time, I was the Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Art Design and Communication. But hardly anyone had a PhD in my field. And someone from the Faculty of Built Environment approached me to see if I would be interested in doing a master's degree in the Center for Design. It was an opening, and I think I might have had a bit to drink. And I said, oh, I've got a master's degree already. <laughs> I'd rather do a PhD. And they said, perfect, we've got We've got scholarships in design because at that time, for a brief moment in Australia, design was a priority. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> and it uh, wasn't very long, but the window was there and I shot through it, and, uh, which I seem to have a knack for, for doing right place, right time, born on the dad's birthday, all of that. Wasn't strategy, but opportunity. And uh, I, th I think it's very important to know when an opportunity is there. And again, I... I blame my grandparents for that. <laughs> the, the opportunity to lie low, be an opera singer, never have your passport looked at, or to um, almost essentially be a stowaway on a boat from Amsterdam to, to get to the US. So after a lot of deliberation about what the thesis could be about, I decided to concentrate on a, an idea I'd been interested in for a long time. And indeed, one of the reasons I went to Tasmania is I have a long-standing interest in the idea of nature and wilderness. So I started looking at advertisements for white goods. The running joke is that my PhD is about white goods. Um, I have a friend whose PhD is about sheep, about f sheep in films. <laughs> and mine was about advertising of white goods. But really, what it's a, the, the core of it is the idea of nature as a social construct and how that's borne out in advertising. So it was an interpretive analysis of advertisements for all sorts of goods. And I settled on white goods in the end. Um, and the tropes that they use to define nature. And in defining nature in this way, it also reinforces some very static ideas of nature, which are not actually particularly helpful in terms of serious challenges like climate change. So I looked at about 250, 300 ads from the US, Australia, and Germany. And some of those common tropes were, apart from a washing machine turning up in a field, um, 
were the idea of nature's power, uh, a very common one in relation to washing machines in particular. And all of these are for washing machines, ovens, dryers, refrigerators, often that had an echo feature or claimed to be saving you money in some way by pushing a button, which usually just turns off something, that button that you pay more for that says echo. Um, the classic kind of advertisement of threat and remedy. So this is a trope of nature requiring protection. And you can enact this protection and do the right thing by buying a mealy. You may not have known that, but that's how it is. So can you really afford to waste 100 liters of water per wash? No, you can't. What can you do about it? This is your classic threat and remedy. Have you got bad breath? Buy our toothpaste. It's a sort of advertisement. So you live on the driest continent on Earth. This I didn't have that headline anywhere else except in Australia and other countries that had a, a much less um, poignant kind of headline. Uh, in Australia, water works well. So these, AEG was also following Mealy's lead. Mealy was always very progressive in this regard. So there were appliances that save water, control waste. They do good on your behalf. And they will appeal to other things that are happening in the community at the time, like the not in my backyard movement. So yes, you can get rid of that nuclear waste and build it, you know, and put buried under the ground, but not in my backyard. So the idea of being responsible for one's backyard, so indeed being responsible for one's broader environment, um, all played on by the advertising industry. This one is from the star rating system. It was used in the US in the time, although we have a similar star rating system, that one with the sort of dial on it that you see when you buy appliances here. So again, nature is requiring protection. If something has an energy star rating, you don't have to do anything except buy the appliance and plug it in, and you are reducing smog, for example, with this refrigerator, which again has turned up in a field. And when, <laughs> when I said I did a, a visual analysis, there's, there's visual tropes in this. The horizon line that's high and flat, that is, I can't see over the horizon, so the horizon line is just, just where I want to feel that I'm about to reach it and obtain something obtain smog reduction in this case. So it, it isn't low, it isn't a landscape, but that long letterbox look is aspirational. Um, there's a couple of other tropes we'll come up across, or they'll, appear to, they'll appeal to your party allegiances. So your political party will be engaged to sell you a refrigerator. Refrigerators are the hardest things to sell. They don't do anything, they're quite passive compared to something like a, a washing machine. So refrigerators tend to turn up in moonscapes. So here's a, an example of, of nature is magical. So nature can also do these magical things that we can't do. So it needs to be protected. You need to buy this appliance to make that happen. Here's another nature is magic. The green machine genie grants your wish for a more careful watch. And, and you can't read the text, but the, the text goes on about it takes care of your clothes while taking care of the environment. You don't have to do anything. You just got to plug it in. And I was a bit of a maniac collecting these images at one point. I always had a pocket knife from wherever I went, <laughs> primarily in women's magazines, usually the back page or the second last page. And I was right at the end of the thesis, which I did part time and it took me an eternity, but I was right at the, the end of the thesis and I was looking for that last iconic image. And I went into a fish and chip shop one night to get dinner and I found it. And uh, this you know, if you buy this refrigerator, there's a promise of Eden. And the text is, guess who makes a fridge that preserves more than just food? In other words, it preserves the environment. And here's another classic advertising trope of having a halo around something that comes from the 1920s and 30s. So it's a good object. You don't, you don't have any sense of the ground plane or the distance. It's just kind of come out of the ether in a glow. And it's keystoned, reverse keystones. It's wide at the bottom, it's narrow at the top, it's leaning away from you, it's aspirational. So when people ask me, how do you analyze images? That's how you do it. <laughs> so that's what it's about. So this had a profound impact on my practice. I should emphasize that there's a few different ways to do a PhD in, in my world. You could do them by project, which means by artwork, or in the case of architecture, by the work that you're doing in, in building. Um, you can do them by publication, which is collecting a lot of work that you've done previously and then writing an exe a further exegesis around it. Or you can do them purely by thesis, which is the traditional way. I chose the traditional way. I figured I was already out there on a limb doing one in, in 
anything to do with the arts anyway. I did mine the traditional way. Also, I was helping to write the PhD by project um, for the Faculty of Art and Design and Communication, which the Faculty of Architecture and Built Environment already had at the time. So I thought it wasn't a good idea to write it while I was doing it. <laughs> Um, and that's also why I did it in another faculty. And the thesis had a very deep and lasting effect on my work. I collected a number of quotes, and I haven't showed you a, a long history I have in tech space work, um, but I went on to use those quotes in a series of sign works, and uh, it, the series is called Twice as Natural, from Lewis Carroll's Large as Life and Twice as Natural. And this, for example, was the second iteration, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, of a place where I did this work. And in fact, a few years ago, I had to say, I'm not doing these anymore. I kept getting invited to do them everywhere. And now everybody uses sign boards for everything. At the time, it was quite rare. Indeed, trying to convince the people to hire one to me and let me program it myself was a challenge. They wanted to put the letters in for me. And I'm going, no, no, progress is a comfortable disease. And they said, no, we don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> and I said, just give me the keyboard and, and let me do it. Um, and these works, I have to tell you, are a bear to photograph because those images only show for a couple of seconds. So for every good slide you see, there's 30 others with half-shown flip plates. So I prefer the ones with flip plates, which they don't make anymore, like they used to have on buses, and they make that beautiful sound as they change. So you'd be standing in front of this machine and be making that sound. This is in Melbourne, and it's in what was then a new parkland called Beerung Mar, which was next to the River Yarra. It was a reconstruction of a hill that used to be there. So again, this idea of reconstructing um, an environment that didn't exist previously. Or sorry, it hadn't existed recently, but used to exist previously. And I'll just go through some of um, that series. So Wilderness Begins Right Here Where We Live, which is from Tim Lowe. And Landscape is the Work of the Mind, which many of you, I think, will probably recognize from Stephen Sharma. Now, while I was photographing this work, and this is another indication of being open to opportunity, photographing this work and cursing quietly under my breath, taking lots of images of black screens in between and in the next, the next wash, a man came up to me, and that man was Jim Sinatra. And Jim Sinatra was a professor of landscape architecture at RMIT, but he retired a few years previously, so I kind of knew him. I didn't really know him that well. Um, and he's also an American, and he's also from Philadelphia. Uh, not that I knew that, but we started talking, and we had a great chat, and he loved the work, and I was just out on a sunny afternoon trying to photograph this. He was just out for a walk, and he said, you know, we have a studio diagonally opposite RMIT, and we usually have an artist sharing our studio, and we don't have anyone at the moment. Would you like to join us? And I was just at a point of thinking of going back to having the studio-based practice. I don't work like a traditional artist. I don't have a studio. I have a project-based practice. I work from project to project, and I often have three or four projects on the go at any one time. Not all of them come off. I pitch for three or four projects, so much more like an architect works. I pitch for three or four projects at a time, and sometimes I get them all, in which case I have a breakdown, or I get none. <laughs> it's, it's a lottery. So I said, yes, Jim, I'd love to be in a studio with you. And that struck up a fantastic relationship and later a collaboration between the landscape architects, Finn Murphy, Jim Sinatra, and I. So Sinatra Murphy is the name of the landscape architecture firm. Jim got very excited. And if those of you who know Jim, he's very excitable. Um, got very excited about the idea of working as an artist, and he encouraged the idea that we would work together in a collaborative team, something I've not done a lot of in my, my history, and enter the Helen Lempier Sculpture Award and Exhibition. And for that exhibition, about 200 people enter, and they select about, at that, that time, at about 15, 16. Later, they used to select about 20. And we were selected, and we were, our proposal was to build this work in the trees. And they had never had anyone want to build work in the trees before, so that was a challenge, and this is where having landscape architects was really handy, because they could get people to do analysis for them on the strength of the trees, not just the arborists, but also other connections that they had, um, uh, engineers and so on. When you w Once you hoist a work up in the air, you have to be awfully sure it's not going to hurt anybody when it falls down, and no matter how little it is, it's usually going to hurt somebody when it falls down. Just think of a gum nut hitting you on the head, you know what I mean. Something that size would probably kill you. Um, and there was a, another element, which was this garden was completely European. So this is, the, is uh, Werribee uh, Mansion. Um, the Helen Lempier as a prize no longer exists. Perpetual trustees folded up, 
their relationship to this prize, so it's sadly gone, like many of the large sculpture prizes in Australia. And um, they were nervous about us working in the trees, but particularly because we wanted to work across four trees, only four trees out of the 270 or so trees in the garden that were native trees. We left all the European trees alone. So it w there was a lot of negotiation and consultation in convincing them of what we wanted. So Sinatra Murphy taught me, and I think I taught them. Um, they had never really made something by hand. They didn't know what a pop rivet was. I found that hard to believe. <laughs> um, they never drilled so many holes in their life. Those of you who know what pop rivets are, you have to drill a hole to put a pop rivet in. And the strapping on these is made of aluminium. And so where they cross over, each one of those had to be pop riveted, sometimes double pop riveted. So I lost track of how many pop rivets there were. Felt like thousands. Um, and again, all, all made by hand. In fact, we rented a special studio just to make it in. Meanwhile, I was also on the city, I was the chair, actually, of the City of Melbourne's Public Art Committee, and I was also the deputy chair of the Cultural Affairs Committee for the City of Melbourne. Now, most people in the room who know Melbourne as a city will know that the laneways are very important to the fabric of the city and very enlivened. But that wasn't the case in the early 90s. In the early 90s, the, the very visionary city planner and director of city planning, Rob Adams, thought that the laneways of Melbourne were something that was unique, and he wanted to do something to bring attention to that. And he proposed that to me as the chair of the Public Art Committee for the City of Melbourne, and I said, that's a great idea. We need to commission somebody to write a plan. We commissioned the fantastic Catherine Murphy, who wrote the plan that started the first laneways commission. So I'm just going to show you three slides of these. There are now been many, many of these commissions. And as you know, if you visit Melbourne now, the laneways are very alive and full of people and open late, and you can get food and lots of activity happening. They didn't used to be that. They used to be the place you would avoid, particularly if you were, were on your own walking home at night, and particularly if you were a woman, sometimes even during the day. So this is a wonderful work by Luisa Bufaderci who um, did a statistical analysis of the city of Melbourne over a number of years and painted it into one of the narrowest and longest laneways. Um, this is Evangelos Sicaris. We got in a lot of trouble for this one. <laughs> Evangelos Sicaris, who changed a lot of the parking signs in, the, in one of the laneways. Interestingly, this work still exists. Um, it, it caused such a controversy getting it up, we just kind of quietly let it stay up. Uh, not all of it's in good nick anymore. And he put um, he's of Greek heritage, as you can tell by his name, and he put sayings from Greek, ancient Greek philosophy up on all of the signs. So the good and the ill are one. The softest overcomes the hardest. And of course, pe delivery guys didn't know where to park their vans. It was, <laughs> it, it, was, it was complete chaos. Actually, I've got to say, this one, when we decommissioned, it also caused chaos because we all assumed that we'd send in the guys with the spray guns and that would be fine. What we didn't realize is that that asphalt was just a very thin veneer on an old bluestone lane. So when the paint came off, so did the asphalt. Um, I didn't make myself any favors that year with the people running the budget um, in terms of what that work cost to decommission. And indeed, it's why we left this one up in the end. And this work, which was also a particularly beautiful one by Duke Albada, who's a, um, she's a Dutch artist, actually, who came to live in Australia. And she does very interesting works with, um, with water and the idea of the underground. And she's also an architect by training. And again, because this is a natural drain in one of the laneways, recommissioning it to be an artwork, stopping it being a drain, and then making it foam up every half hour on the half hour, which completely spun people out. Um, but it was a fantastic idea of you know, what's going into the bay, what's going down the drain, um, was a, a particularly beautiful work. So I'm very uh, lucky and also very proud to have been part of that time in Melbourne of, of reconfiguring the laneways. And again, that's about one's role as an advocate for one's, one's discipline. And all the while, and in part to, to keep my sanity, I have a, in my house in Melbourne a, a very beautiful Australian garden, and I subscribe to Australian plants. And I got this in the mail one, one day, and I thought, what a fantastic, turn it sideways as you do. I think that's the way it came out of the envelope, and I want a fantastic idea for an artwork. I must, I must do something with that one of these days. That happens to me a lot. I have hundreds of ideas for artworks that will never necessarily happen. And about a week later, one of my colleagues, I had by then moved to the Victorian College of the Arts at Melbourne University, and I was the head of sculpture and spatial practice. I arrived and it was called the sculpture department and within a week I changed it to the name of sculpture and spatial practice to open it up. I have a history of following 
the people I fondly call the heavy metal men, the, the guys from the 50s and 60s who worked with formalist sculptors, that means sculptors who worked primarily with form, often big heavy metal form in space, Henry Moore, David Smith, and so on. Um, and they had ran all of the sculpture departments through the 70s and 80s in Australia, and I kind of walked in the door as a conceptualist, and having worked with Robert Owen at RMIT for 10 years, um, and shifted that in a, in a different direction. So I joined the VCA around this time, uh, actually about a year b before the work I'm about to show you. And one of my colleagues said, why don't you enter the McClelland Sculpture Award? And after doing the Helen Lempier as a team, I was keen to try the McClelland on my own. So I went that plus this equals that, right? How easy is that, right? Let's do that again. That plus this equals this. <laughs> great idea. Sent it off in an envelope like that, said this is what I want to do, and they went, yeah, it looks like a great idea. And I did say, I will need a cherry picker for the one up at the top. And they went, yeah, yeah, you can have a cherry picker. No problem. Then making the thing, another story entirely, 56 high-density polystyrene arms. Those arms come up to well above my waist. Kind of, they're about as half as tall as me, and they're high-density, so cutting them on a bandsaw means you have to change the saw on the bandsaw every few hours. I tried to estimate how many hours I cut these the other night, and I gave up when I got around 200. I thought, I don't know. All I know was I was cutting them for weeks and covered in polystyrene for weeks. And for about a year afterward, I'd put my hand in my jeans pocket and take out a pile of polystyrene baubles. Um, so the cylinders on the far right is as they came from the factory, and I had to have them specially made. And because they don't just make high density polystyrene for no reason, it's expensive. Then they're facet cut like they are in the bag, which is actually a form I really like, and I still have a bunch of these. Um, much to moving to Sydney's chagrin. And then they're filed and sanded by hand on the left, and then they have to be assembled. And I did all of this stage, and by now, time was getting short, I was getting exhausted, and I knew I was going to have to invoke some help. So I used the very wonderful Artery Cooperative, which was run by a number of students over the past decade that I had taught, had gotten together and put this cooperative together, and other people that I didn't know. And they rented a space, they registered as a cooperative, and they make art for other people. And they did the layup for me. So this is made just like a surfboard, but instead of polyester resin, it's acrylic resin, so it's a lot safer. That still doesn't mean it's completely messy. And every time I went to visit them and saw these people covered in yellow, I thought, I'm so glad I'm paying you to do this work instead of me. Um, because it's a lot of work and a lot of sanding, and because of their form, and because every arm is different, they had to be handmade. Then the work had to be gotten back down to the gallery, and this is my long-suffering husband, Robert, Dr. Robert Rowe, who didn't know that his PhD in chemistry from Sussex in the UK, synthetic chemistry, he's a maker too, um, that he didn't know it would prepare him for a life <laughs> as the artist's assistant and truck driver. There he is looking happy, we'd arrived. It did turn into a 40 degree day and before the end of the day, I was up in a cherry picker that I, when I arrived they said, oh you need a cherry picker? I said, yeah remember I put it in the form. They said, oh we'll give you, we'll give you one later in the day, heat of the day. They gave me a kid to run the cherry picker who I don't think had ever experienced anything with a choke. So I'm holding one of them, going up in the cherry picker, and he's got the choke on, and I'm going, turn the choke off over the arms. Turn the choke off, turn the choke off, it's gonna stall. <laughs> and he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, the button, the button, the button that says choke, push it. <laughs> and he didn't push it, and it stalled, and I got so sunburned putting that one on the roof <laughs> as, as a result. But anyway, we just had to wait like you do when you, when you flood something, you have to let it drain, and then you can start it again. So that's how the work looked installed. Um, the, uh, and it, it was a beautiful work. I haven't actually been able to sell it, so I still have it, but I've left it in, I've left it in Tasmania, and I'm probably going to donate it to the university because it's, it's big. And it actually has five parts, four at the front of the building and this fifth one at the back, photographed with the three graces, which just seemed, just seemed appropriate at the time. Um, and I'll move now to my shift back to Tasmania, and that was a really interesting period. I was made an associate professor on my first application, I have to say, when I was at the University of Melbourne at the VCA, the Victorian College of the Arts, and then I got a phone call from the University of Tasmania saying they were looking for someone to head the art school, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll apply, I'll go back, they know me, I'll go. 
and they did offer me position and as a full professor, so I went. And we ended up living near a river. And I have a long-standing interest, as I've noted, in the idea of social construction of nature. And the rivers of Tasmania are particularly interesting. And this one is, was a river not far from our house. Now, where that orange marker is, is a sewerage plant. And sewerage is a kind of fascination of mine. Back when I lived in Philadelphia, I fell into a drain and nearly drowned. And it was only a drain, it wasn't a sewer pipe. But as I was sitting in the hot bathtub, my older brother was teasing me that it was a sewer pipe, sitting in a hot bathtub recovering from the shock of having nearly drowned. My brother was harassing me about, oh, you were in a sewer pipe, weren't you? Yeah, sure you were. <laughs> what did you see? Was the water brown? And he was giving me a very hard time about it. So I've had a kind of fascination with, with water quality. I guess, you know, I want to speak academically about it, water quality ever since. And I've been looking at works like uh, Oliver Eliasson's Green River in Stockholm in 2000, where this Danish Icelandic artist dyed the river green. And um, this was with a chemical which isn't harmful, it's actually red, it hits the water, turns green, stays green for a couple of hours, and he did this in a clandestine way, overnight. So people woke up to the river in Stockholm looking like this, and it caused a complete panic, as you can imagine. But really interesting idea. And academically, I was looking at landscape architects like Dilip de Kuna and Arundhata Mather, who look at the idea of flooding and examine flooding and the idea of disturbance that flooding cause, but purely as a human construct, as a human concern. And they've done work with rivers worldwide. And also from my PhD thesis, I was reading people like Klaus Eder and William Lees, Satjali, about, uh, particularly in relation to advertising, and Max Oschlager on the idea of nature. So I started thinking about that river that was behind my art school and the sewerage that went into it. And there wasn't actually a river, it's an estuary, so it doesn't really flow clearly, that is its tidal. So the sewerage goes out, and then it comes back, and then it goes out a little further, and then it comes back, and then it goes out a little further again, and then it comes back. And I started looking at images of E. coli. I settled on one, which also reminded me of the way rivers look. I settled on one, and I made, I got permission to use this image, and I made thousands of postcards, and I laid them out on the floor of the gallery of the building, mapping exactly the river that was behind the building. Uh, because when I turned up at this art school, the first thing they asked me was, have you read the flood plan? <laughs> and I did have to enact the flood plan a few times, which meant moving a lot of artworks upstairs. And I also did a number of artworks over time about the idea of water and sewerage and where that, where that construction of the idea of a flood, where it starts and ends, and why is, is it defined in the way that it is. And actually, in working this way, I sometimes am interrupting the work of other artists. And this is the very wonderful the images, the two photographs are the very wonderful David Stevenson's, uh, one of the few artists in Australia who's won an ARC grant to make artwork about the environment in his case, and his work about the flood line. He's done a very beautiful series of works, and this is two of them, uh, about the idea of rising tides. Um, and he was quite happy for my sandbags to interrupt his work. And I just want to speak a little bit about colleagues, peers, and mentors, and going back to that earlier picture of Bill and Harriet and the importance of recognizing a mentor when you see one, even if you don't necessarily set up a formal relationship with them. Because my experience is they just pop up, and that's what I really love about this image of Alex Denko, um, which it, it just has this feeling that he's just popped up out of the screen, uh, and that is a very Alex image, for those of you who know Alex. <laughs> Alex has a huge retrospective exhibition on at the moment at the Museum of Contemporary Art, it just opened. And I worked with Alex for a little while, so he was a, a great influence on me. Uh, he was making this work while he, I knew him, and this one's in the MCA. Um, also Robert Owen, who I worked with for 10 years. I was very lucky in that I was in the sculpture department taking Inga King's job at RMIT for about a year, and then Robert was brought in as the new head, and Robert had examined my master's degree at the University of Tasmania, so he kind of knew me, and there was a lot of us who were casual, and he, I think there were about seven of us, and he could only keep three. And he asked us all to take on a different challenge, and my challenge was to write a curriculum for three years for a sculpture department, and I had two days. And I went, I can do that. <laughs> sure, I can do that. I want this job. I want to work with you. And I did, and I got it. And Robert has been a fantastic um, 
a person in my life, a, a mentor, a friend, someone to have a, a cackle laugh with, has also has been Mark Stoner, who I worked with at the VCA. A lot of the public works in not only Melbourne, but also now if you land in the airport in Adelaide, you'll see one of Mark's beautiful works um, in stone and ceramics. We share a, a ceramic history, Mark and I. His was based on the brick, and now he's moved on to stone carving, so that work that he's sitting in, which is at the Docklands in Melbourne, is brick, but in the background, it's uh, completely carved stone. And this is very aligned with Susan's comments on placemaking. The Docklands is a very austere kind of environment to work in, and I'll get back to the Docklands in just a sec. And also really wonderful sculptors like Simone Slee. Simone took over the sculpture department when I left the Victorian College of the Arts at Melbourne Uni to go to the University of Tasmania. Um, she was a PhD student of mine. She's just finished, and this is actually her PhD work. It's from her series called Help a Sculpture because she was always making sculptures that would fall over and fall apart, so she's decided to make her work about that, which I think is really inspired. She calls it ab function. <laughs> and here she is helping the sculpture stand up. And I could show a lot of students' work, because I've been teaching a long time, but I'm just going to show a few first-year students' works in particular. First year and master's and PhD are my two favorite ends of the spectrum. I love them all, but... There's something really fantastic about first year and working with those ideas of literacies, other kinds of literacies. <clears throat> so physical object literacy, um, for example, with this contemplative knee device, so the contemplative object, installation-based practices, performance-based practices. And no, this isn't what we do to naughty students, although that's what it looks like. <laughs> this is actually something this, this girl chose to do. Um, works in the public domain. And particularly because of my history with working with the laneways in the city of Melbourne, um, I got a phone call from Docklands when it was being developed as a new area to live, and they asked if we, it's the kind of phone calls you get all the time when you run a sculpture department, they asked if we would have some students who might want to put some sculpture down at the dock. And I thought, yes, but no, because we teach our students to be professional, you want them to do that, you need to pay them. So let's make this a commission. And let's make this a project where the students actually have to go through the same process a professional artist would in the real domain. And so the Victoria Harbour Young Artists Initiative exhibition was born. This has been running um, since I left. It's been running about seven years now, I guess, seven or eight years. Uh, and students proposed and were selected, had to present, and then given a small amount of money to commission works that they made. And making works in the water is particularly difficult. Um, making works in the public domain is particularly difficult. This orange barrier was there, but this student made thousands of barnacles. This is only one instance of the barnacles. They were distributed amongst the site uh, that were the same shade of orange and, and attached to the, the barriers. Uh, students working in a nearby oval because it was all about the amenity of the space, so text all laid out in chalk, all done by hand. Trying to look out for students' well-being in this kind of domain is also hard because they learn how hard it is to work in the, in the public domain. There's lots of safety issues, regulations. Things have to be approved beforehand. Um, and sometimes things students want to do aren't particularly easy to approve. So sometimes they would work indoors instead. Those are uh, parachutes. But a number of them did work outdoors <coughs> um, in all sorts of various ways. Again, a, another work on the, the water. And poor Mark Stoner got so sunburned helping this girl <laughs> wrap all these, these vests around um, the, these pillars in the water. So it's important as an artist, and I think also as a, an academic or anyone who's a scholar who's gotten to the professorial domain, um, to acknowledge the work of the peers' colleagues and also the students who really take you on that journey. This project has subsequently, about a year after I left and, and Simone took it over, it's in very good hands, won an Australian Business Arts Foundation award for its initiative, which is terrific because it gives it enough money to continue. Um, and the, as tends to happen, and if you watch the sitcom Utopia, you know that planners circulate a lot, so all the planners I started with are no longer in Vic Urban, which isn't even called Vic Urban anymore. Um, so it was really important to have a little pocket of money to continue with. So all of these people have been incredibly important in my trajectory. And back to my fabulous family, one thing I didn't say about them is that what's very important in our family is, is laughing. We laugh a lot. I think somewhere in that one serious grandparent doing all the right paperwork and the other one just turning up, we all realized it's a bit of a joke. And that 
all of my siblings, um, they work either in the high end of IT or in finance. It really cracks me up, and I think I might have been making a joke about it at this particular Christmas picture, of all of them have been made redundant or been out of work at one time or another. I never have. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the artist in the family. <laughs> And I think that's just too funny. So much to my poor dad, my dad passed away earlier this year, so much to my poor dad's chagrin, uh, only my older brother who has a master's in philosophy and I ended up at university and we both studied things that he really didn't wish for us to study. Um, but one of his favorite, he would always have sort of deep conversations with you and I remember sitting on the curb making something when I was an undergraduate and he came out to say, look, you know, university is really expensive. Are you sure you want to do a master's degree? Are you sure you want to do it overseas? Indeed, going to Tasmania was cheaper than where I was planning on going in the U.S., which was the Chicago Institute of the Arts, which I'd been accepted to as well, and I went to Tasmania. Wow. Um, <laughs> nut. I was a nut. And I said, yeah, Dad, this is what I, this is what I want to do. It's, it's definitely what I want to do. And he said, okay, your education is the one thing no one can take away from you, which is such a... a, a, a of someone who's come from a migrant family. It's such a thing for them to say. But I've had an, been very lucky. I've had generous, patient people. I haven't had that many, in fact, I'm not sure, I think I've had one official mentor. I've had lots of coaches since I've become a more senior academic and a senior executive. But that kind of in order is the number of people who have been particularly important in my life, and I should have added Rob Adams into that. And there's a couple of names there you didn't hear me <coughs> say. It's, some of you will recognize this name, like Alan Fells, who was a professor of popular sect sector management at Monash, and also the head of the ACCC for many years. For a while, I worked, when I had that job in sculpture at RMIT, I was half time, and the other half time, I was a professional staff member at Monash, fixing computers, because I seem to have that gene. Half my family's in computers. My dad also worked in data management. And that, you know, so I, I walked both sides of that divide for a very long time, and I know that professional staff really run the joint as a result. And I fixed Alan's computer, and Alan asked me to come and set up his computers at home, which I did because he had a disabled daughter, which he's very open about, and I helped her to learn to computer, computer and that helped her along too. And other amazing people like Henry Urgas and Robert Owen, and uh, a couple of VCs in there as well. Take note. <laughs> I tend to end up working with them closely. So those are some of the people who have influenced me and been supportive, and that's what's important to continue to do for others. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's been really lovely, and I hope I didn't go for two hours. I tried not to. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Marie. For those who don't know me, my name's Ross Harley. I'm the Dean of Art and Design. And what a great pleasure to see some of those secret photographs, which we love that people share. Like, we never get to see these sorts of things around the faculty. And um, I love the, the photo of you and, and your dad and your family in particular. I think we can all be especially thankful that you were, in fact, born on the same day as your father, and that, that led you to a series of moments where you were at the right place at the right time. So I'm very glad that you were one of 25 people. Can you imagine? Only 25 postgraduate international students coming to study in Australia, Tasmania no less, and not at the Chicago School of the Arts. We're very lucky that you were born in Philadelphia as well, and you were able to see the work of Marcel Duchamp and also of Alexander Calder, which teach all of us of the unity of the arts and the sciences. It's also a great way to think about the way in which we all have making as part of our culture, and that we all have part of our nature, the connection between the mind and the hand. And I think you've shown beautifully how we think not just with our brains and with our minds, but that the mind goes into our hands and the practice that we as artists and designers are engaged in is about understanding and discovering new forms of intelligence and knowledge that work in ways that might seem strange to many of our colleagues. So I particularly thank you for that. I also should say that 
not only were you in the right place at the right time at all those other occasions, but we think you're at the right place, the right time here, and we're very pleased to have you as our Deputy Dean and Head of School of Art and Design. So thank you very much, Maureen. We're almost done, and it's almost time for drinks. Um, what a great evening. I, I, this has been wonderful academic inaugural lectures, but, but also, I think, a wonderful evening of entertainment, and the entertainment will continue afterwards. Um, we've heard some great things. I, I meant to say at the beginning that Robert and David, we're absolutely delighted that you're, you're here. Um, it's, it's great to have you here, and we've heard wonderful lectures. The, as the lectures are going on, I was thinking, well, what, what does this tell us about our university? And actually, by the end of the two lectures... I had six things, which I think say everything about our university and energy strategy. We are research intensive, but we're also teaching intensive, and we're proud of both of them. We are a, aspiring to be Australia's global university, and we are, if we're not there already, we are well on the way. We believe passionately in equality, equality of gender, and equality in every other way. We are a broad-based university. People used to think of this as a science and technology university. We are still a science and technology university. We're, we're much, much more. And we've heard some wonderful things tonight from built environment and art and design. And finally, we believe in partnership and collaboration. And we've heard some wonderful examples of that this evening. It's, it's been a wonderful evening. Please do stay for some drinks afterwards in the foyer. I invite you to... Join me in congratulating once again Marie and Susan on two wonderful lectures. <laughs>